Chapter Eight of Our Army at the Front. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Army at the Front by Haywood Brown. Chapter Eight. The American Expeditionary Force, which went into the great training schools of France and England was nothing so much as a child who having long been tutored in a program of his own make an abundance of what he liked and nothing of what he didn't should be thrust into some grade of public school he would be ridiculously advanced in mathematics and a dunce at grammar or historian to his fingertips and ignorant that two and two make four he would amaze his fellow pupils in each respect equally and that was the lot of the expeditionary force the french found them backward in trench work and bombing and naturally enough expected that backwardness to follow through they conceded the natural quickness of the pupils but saw a long road ahead before they could become an army then the americans tackled artillery hardest and deepest of the war problems and suddenly blossomed out as experts of course the analogy is not to be leaned on too heavily the americans were not on the instant the arch exponents of artillery in all europe but it is true that in comparison to the size of their army and to the extent to which they had prepared nationally for war their artillery was stronger than that of any other country on the allied side at the beginning of the war notwithstanding that it was the point where they might legitimately have been expected to be the weakest hilaire belloc called the american artillery preparation one of the most dramatic and welcome surprises of the war it must be understood that all this applies only to men and not in the least to guns for big guns the american reliance was wholly upon france and england upon the invitation of those two countries when america entered the war and the readiness of america's men was not due to a large preparation in artillery as such the blessing arose from the fact that the coast defences could be diverted within the first year of the war to the handling of big guns for land armies and thus strengthen the artillery arms sent to france for final training artillery was every country's problem even in peacetime it was the service which required the greatest wealth and the most profound training there was no such thing as a citizenry trained to artillery mathematics was its stronghold and no smattering could be made to do even more than mathematics was the facility of handling the big guns when the mathematics went askew from special conditions these things the coast defence had if not in final perfection at least in creditable degree and the diversion of it to the artillery in france stiffened the backbone of the expeditionary force to the pride of the force and the glad amazement of its preceptors one other thing the coast defence had done it had pre-empted the greater part of america's attention in times of peace and unpreparedness so that big gun problems had received disproportionate amount of study the american technical journals on artillery were always of the finest the war services were honeycombed with men who were big gun experts so when the first artillery training school opened in france in mid-august of nineteen seventeen the problems to be faced were all of a more or less external character the first of these of course was airplane work the second was in mastering gun differences between american and french types and in learning about the enormous numbers of new weapons which had sprung from battle almost day by day the camp when the americans moved in had much to recommend it to its new inhabitants there need be no attempt to conceal the fact that first satisfaction came with the barracks second with the weather and only third with the guns and planes some of the artillery men had come from the infantry camps and some direct from the coast those from the vosages camp were boisterous in their praise of their quarters they had brick barracks with floors and where they were billeted with the french they found excellent quarters in the old low-lying stone and brick houses the weather would not have been admired by any outsider but to the men from vosages it owed a reputation because they extolled in it both day and night the artillery camp was in the open country permit of the long ranges and if it sunned a little enough neither did it rain the guns and aeroplanes supplied by the french were simple at first becoming as to guns at least steadily more numerous and complicated as the training went on the men began on the seventy fives 
approximately the american three-inch gun and on the howitzers of twice that size the airplane service was the only part of the work wholly new to the men and naturally enough it was the most attractive although the officers and instructors warned that an air observation and range finding was by far the most dangerous of all artillery service seventy five per cent of the young officers who were eligible for the work volunteered for it this required a two-thirds weeding out and ensured the very pick of men for the air crews the air service with the artillery was made over almost entirely by the french between the time of the war's beginning and america's entrance all the old visual aids were abolished such as smoke pointers and rockets and the telephone and wireless were installed in their stead the observation balloons had the telephone service and the planes had wireless by these means the guns were first fired and then reported on the general system of range finding was first fire long then fire short then split the bracket this was the joint job of planes and gunners one not to be despised as a feat in fact artillery is of all services the one most dependent on cooperation it is always a joint job but the joining must be done among many factors its effectiveness depends first upon the precision of the mathematical calculation which goes before the pull of the lanyard this calculation is complicated by the variety of types of guns and shells and in the case of howitzers by the variable behaviour of charges of different size and power but these are things that can be learned with patience and require knowledge rather than inspiration it is when the air service enters that inspiration enters with it observation must be accurate in spite of weather visibility enemy camouflage and everything else more than that the observer in the plane must keep himself safe often a matter of sheer genius the map maker must do his part so that targets not so elusive as field guns and motor emplacements can be found without much help from the air finally the artillery depends even more than any other branch of the service on the rapidity with which its wants can be filled from the rear the mobility of the big pieces and their constant connections with ammunition stores are matters depending directly on the training of the artillery men these then were the things in which the americans were either tested or trained their mathematics were a one as has been noted and their familiarity with the existing models of big guns sufficient to enable them to pick up the new types without long effort they had a few weeks of heavy going with pad and pencil then they were led to the giant stores of french ammunition more than any of them had ever seen before and told to open fire one dramatic touch exacted by the french instructors was that the guns should be pointed towards germany no matter how impotent their distance made them long lanes up to twelve thousand metres were told off for the ranges the training was intensive because at the time there was a half a plan to put the artillery first into the battle line in any case it is easier to make time on secondary problems than on primary throughout september while the artillery men grew in numbers as well as proficiency the mastering of gun types was perfected and the theory of aim was worked out on paper late in the month the french added more guns chief among them being a monster mounted on railway trucks whose projectile weighed one thousand eight hundred pounds the artillery men named her mosquito because she had a sting although she had served for three hundred charges at verdun it was not long before every type of gun in the french army and many from the british were lined up in the artillery camp being expertly pulled apart and reassembled by the time the artillery went into battle with the infantry failing in their intention to go first alone but nevertheless first in actual fighting they were able to give a fine account of themselves by the time they got back to camp and were training new troops in their own experience they were the centre of an extraordinary organisation the rolling of men from the camp to battle and back again training retraining and fighting in the circle with an increasing number of men able to remain in the line and a constantly increasing number of new men permitted to come out at the beginning ground out an admirable system before the old year was out the fact that the artillery school could not take its material raw did not make the hitches it otherwise would chiefly of course because of the coast defence and somewhat because the american college men were found to have a fine substratum of technical knowledge which artillery could turn to account 
after all the routine was fairly learned and there had been a helpful interim in the line the artillery practised on some specialities partly of their own contribution and partly those suggested by the other armies one of these the most picturesque was the shattering of the pill boxes german inventions for staying in no man's land without being hit a pill box is a tiny concrete fortress set up in front of the trenches usually in groups of fifteen to twenty they have slot-like apertures through which Germans do their sniping. They are supposed to be immune from anything except a direct hit by a huge shell. But the American artillery camp worked out a way of getting them, with luck. Each aperture through which a German inmate sighted and shot was put under fire from automatic rifles, coming from several directions at once, so it was indiscreet for the Bosch to stay near his windows, on any slant he could devise. Under cover of this rifle barrage, bombers crept forward, and at a signal the rifle fire stopped, and the bombers threw their destruction in. All these accomplishments, which did not take over long to learn, enhanced the natural value of the American artilleryman. He became, in a short time, the pride of the army, and a warmly welcomed mainstay to the Allies. Major General Peyton C. March, who took the artillery to France and commanded them in their days of organisation, before he was called back to be chief of staff at washington was always credited by his men with being three-fourths of the reason why they made such a showing general march always credited the matter to his men at any rate between them they put their country's best foot foremost for the first year of america and france and they served as optimism centres even when distress over other delays threatened the stoutest hearts End of chapter eight Chapter 9 of Our Army at the Front. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Army at the Front by Haywood Brown. Chapter 9 The Eyes of the Army. America's beginnings in the air service were pretty closely kin to her other beginnings. She furnished the men. And took over the apparatus and although by september the first nineteen seventeen she had large numbers of aviators in the making in france they were flying or aspiring to in french schools under american supervision with french machines and french instructors there existed in prospect and already in detailed design several enormous flying fields to be built and equipped by america as well as half a dozen big repair shops and one gigantic combination repair shop, assembling shop, and manufacturing plant. But in the autumn, when there were aviators waiting in France to go up that very day, there was no waiting on the fields trimmed by America. When the main school under American supervision had filled to overflowing, the remaining probationers were scattered among the French schools under French supervision. Meanwhile, the engineers and stevedores shared the work of constructing the largest aviation field in the world in central france it was once true of complete armies that they could be trained to warfare in their own home fields and then sent to whatever part of the world happened to be in dispute and they required no more additional furbishing up than a short rest from the journey that is no longer true of anything about an army except the air service and it isn't literally true of them but they approach it so it was practicable give the american aviators nine-tenths of their training at home and leave the merest frills to a few spare days in france this of course takes no account of the first weeks at the battlefront which are only nominally training since in the course of them a flyer may well have to battle for his life and often does catch a german if he chances on one as untutored as himself the french estimate of the necessary time to make an aviator it's about four months before he goes up on the line and about four months in patrol on the line before he is a thoroughly capable handler of a battle plane they cap that by saying that an aviator is born not made anyway and that all generalizations about them are untrue including this one the air policy of france however was in a state of great fluidity at this time they were not prepared to lay down the law because they were in the very act of giving up their own romantic adventurous system of single-man combat 
and were borrowing the German system of squadron formation. They were reluctant enough to accept it, let alone acknowledge their debt to the Germans, but the old knight errantry of the air could not hold up against the new mass attack, and the French are nothing if not practical. Even their early war aviators had prudence dinned into them, that prudence which does not mean niggardliness of fighting spirit, but rather an abstaining from foolhardiness. Each aviator was warned that if he lost his life before he had to, he was not only squandering his own greatest treasure, but he was leaving one man less for France. This was the philosophy of the training school. The French were impatient with a flyer who lost his life to the Germans through an excess of friskiness. They were doubly so at the flyer who endangered his life at school through heedlessness. If you pull the wrong lever, they said, you will kill a man and wreck a machine. Your country cannot afford to pay either for your fool mistakes. But there their dogma ended. Once the flyer had learned to handle his machine, his further behaviour was in the hand of American officers solely, and these, he found, were stored with several very definite ideas. The first of these, the most marked distinction between the French system and the American, was that all American aviators should know the theories of flying and most of its mathematics. Concerning these things, the French cared not a hang. Neither did the American aviators, but they towed the mark just the same, and many a youngster gnawed his pencil indoors and cursed the fate that had placed him with a country so finicky about air currents on paper and so indifferent to the joys of learning by ear. The Americans accepted from the beginning the edict on squadron flying. It was as much a part of their training as field manoeuvres for the infantry and because they had no golden days of daring do to look back upon they did less grumbling besides there was always the chance of getting lost and patrols offered some good opportunities to the venturesome the air service had at this time an extra distinction they were the only arm of america's service that had really impressed the germans the german experts as they spoke through their newspapers were contemptuous of the army and all its works they maintained that it would be impossible for the American transports to bring more than half a million men to France, if they tried forever, because the submarines would add to the inherent difficulties and make American participation of less actual menace than that of Rumania. The Frankfurter Zeitung said, There is no doubt that the Entente lay great stress on American assistance on this point, air warfare, nor do we doubt that the technical resources of the enemy Will achieve brilliant work in this branch but all this has its limits in this field superiority in numbers is by no means decisive quality and the men are what decide major hoffer of the german general staff wrote in the weser zeitung the only american help seriously to be reckoned with is aerial aid there was a quantity of such talk incidentally the same experts who limited America's troops to half a million in France, at the most indulgent estimate, said over and over that a million were to be feared, just the number announced to be in France by President Wilson one year from the time of the first debarkation. The aviators worked hard enough to deserve the German honour. In the French school supervised by the Americans, the schedule would have furnished Dickens some fine material for pathos. The day began at 4 a.m., with a little coffee for an eye-opener. The working day began in the fields at five sharp. If the weather permitted it, there were flights till eleven, when the pupil knocked off for a midday meal. He was told to sleep then till four in the afternoon, when flying recommenced and continued until eight-thirty. The rest of his time was all his own. He spent it getting to bed. It was an average of four months under this regime. The flyer began on the ground, and for weeks he was permitted no more than a dummy machine, which wobbled along the ground like a broken-winged duck, and this he used to learn levers and mechanics, those things he had taught over on paper before he was even allowed on the field. After a while he was permitted in the air with an instructor, and finally alone. There were creditably few disasters. For months there was never a casualty. But if a man had an accident, it was a perfectly open and shut affair. Either he ruined himself or he escaped. It was part of the French system with men who escaped to send them right back into the air as soon as they could breathe, so that the accident would not impair their flying nerves. 
after three or four months of foundation work the term is not too inept for flying the aviator had his final examination a triangular flight of about ninety miles with three landings the landings are the great trick of flying like the old irish story it isn't the falling that hurts you it's the sudden stop if the pupil made his landings with accuracy he was passed on to the big school at Pau, where acrobatics are taught the flight acrobat was the ace the armies found and no man went into battle till he could do spiral serpentine and hairpin turns could manage a tailspin and go into a reel a corkscrew fork which permitted the flyer to make great haste from where he was and yet not lose control of his machine at the same time that he made a tricky target for a bosch machine gun while all this training was going on the ranks of american aviators were filling in at the top the celebrated lafayette escadrille the american aviators who joined the french army at the beginning of the war was taken into the american army in the late summer and all the americans who were in the french aviation service who had arrived by way of the foreign legion were called home they were put at instructing for a time then their several members became the veteran corps of later american squadrons this air unit was finally placed at twelve flyers and two hundred and fifty men and before christmas there was a good number of them a number not to be told till the carefree and uncensored days after the war by the beginning of the new year american aviation fields were taking shape the engineers had laid a spur of railroad to link the largest of them with the main arteries of communication and the labor units had built the same sort of small wooden city that sprang up all over america as cantonments there were roomy barracks a big hall where chapel services alternated with itinerant entertainers a little newspaper building plenty of office barracks with typewriters galore and the little models on which aviators learn their preliminary lessons there is one training field six miles long and a mile and a half wide where all kinds of instruction is going on even to acrobatics and there are several large training schools just behind the fighting lines which have plenty of visiting germans to practice on the enormity of the american air program made it a little unwieldy at first and it got a late start but on the anniversary of its beginning it had unmeasured praise from official france and even before that the french newspapers had loudly sung its praises the american aviator as an individual was a success from the beginning he has unsurpassed natural equipment for an ace and his training has been unprecedentedly thorough and he has dedicated his spirit through and through he has set out to make the germans see how wise they were to be afraid End of chapter nine chapter ten of our army at the front this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Our Army at the Front by Haywood Broon. Chapter 10 The Schools for Officers. The first economy effected after the broad sweep of training was in swing was to segregate the officers for special training and these officer schools fell into two types first there was the camp for the young commissioned officers from plattsburg and similar camps in america to give them virtually the same training as the soldiers had but at a sharper pace inclusive also of more theory and to increase their executive ability in action second there was the school established by general pershing late in the year through which non-commissioned officers could train to take commissions of the first type there were many of the second only one the camp for the plattsburgh graduates which turned its men first into the fighting was one having about three hundred men situated in the south of france where the weather could do its minimum of impeding these youngsters arrived in september and they were fighting by thanksgiving the next batch took appreciably less time to train partly because the organization had been tried out and perfected on the first contingent and partly because they were so destined for a longer stay in the line before they were hauled back for training others this process was duplicated in scores of schools throughout france 
so that the expeditionary force what with its reorganization to require fewer officers and its complementary schools never lacked for able leadership the first school was under command of major general robert bullard a veteran infantry officer with long experience in the philippines to draw on and a conviction that the proper time for men to stop work was when they dropped of exhaustion his officers began their course with a battalion of french troops to aid them and they were put into company formation of about seventy-five men to the company just as the humble Dugoy was they were all infantry officers who were to take command as first and second lieutenants but they specialized in whatever they chose they were distinguished by their hat bands white for bayonet experts blue for the liquid fire throwers yellow for the machine gunners red for the rifle grenadiers orange for the hand grenadiers and green for the riflemen these indicated roughly the various things they were taught there in addition to trench digging and the so-called battalion problems recognizable to the civilian as teamwork their work was not of the fireside or the library it was the joint opinion of general pershing general siebert and general bullard that the way to learn to dig a trench was to dig it and that nothing could so assist an officer in directing men at work as having first done the very job himself they had a permanent barracks which had once housed young french officers in pre-war days and they had a generous saturday to monday town leave these two benefactions plus their tidal waves of enthusiasm carried them through the herculean program devised by general bullard and the assisting french officers and troops they began of course with trench digging and followed with live grenades machine guns automatic rifles service shells bayonet work infantry formation for attack and gas tests then they were initiated into light and fire signals star shells gas bombing and liquid fire last they came in on the rise of the wave of rifle popularity and trained at it even more intensively than the first of the doughboys the rifle is the american weapon was general pershing's constant reiteration and it has other uses then as a stick for a bayonet but efficacious as schools of this type were there was a need they did not meet a need first practical then sentimental and equally valuable on both counts this was the training for the man from the ranks the war college in america acting in one of its rare snatches of spare time had ordered a school for officers in america to which any enlisted man was eligible general pershing overhauled this arrangement in one particular he framed his school in france so that nothing lower than a corporal could enter it this was on the theory that a man in the ranks who had ability showed it soon enough and was rewarded by a non-com rank that was the time when the way ahead should rightfully be open to him this school commenced its courses just before christmas with everything connected with it thoroughly worked out first the commissions it was entitled to bestow went up to the rank of major scholars entered it by recommendation of their superior officers which were forwarded by the commanders of divisions or other separate units and by the chiefs of departmental staffs to the commander-in-chief before these recommendations could be made the record of the applicant must be scanned closely and his efficiency rated if he were a linesman by fighting quality and if in training still or behind the lines by efficiency in all other duties then he entered and fared as it might happen if he succeeded his place was waiting for him at graduation as second lieutenant in a replacement division enormous numbers of these replacement divisions had to be held behind the lines from them all vacancies occurring in the combat units in the lines were filled and rank within them proceeded in the same manner as in any other division their chief difference was that there was no limit set upon the number of second lieutenants they could include so that promotions waited mainly for action to earn them within the combat units the vacancies were to be filled two-thirds by men in line of promotion within the unit itself and one-third from the replacement divisions the replacement divisions higher officers 
were those recovered from wounds who had lost their place in line and those who had not yet had any assignments to keep up a sufficient number of replacement divisions the arriving depot battalions were held to belong with them this school was located near the fighting line and its instructors were preponderantly american it put the stars of the general into the private's knapsack and began the great mill of officer making that the experiences of other armies had shown to be so tragically necessary needless to say it was packed to overflowing from its first day End of chapter 10chapter eleven of our army at the front this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon our army at the front by haywood brown chapter eleven some distinguished visitors so satisfactory to itself was the progress of the american expeditionary force in becoming an army that by the end of its first month of training it was ready for important visitors true the first to come was one who would be certain to understand the force's initial difficulties and who would also be able to help as well as inspect he was general patan commander-in-chief of the french army and he came for inspection of both french and american troops on august nineteenth three days after general siebert had had a family field day to take account of his troops general patan came down with general pershing and the first inspection was of billets then the two generals reviewed the alpine chasseurs and general patan awarded some medals which had been due since the month before when the blue devils were in the line after general patan's visit with the american troops he recommended their training and their physique equally and said i think the american army will be an admirable fighting force within a short time this was also general pershing's day for learning his first session with one of his most difficult tasks he had to follow the example of general patan and kiss the children and accept the bouquets thrust upon both generals by all the little girls of the nearby Voska towns general pershing did better with the kissing as his day wore on though its foreignness to his experience was plain to the end but with the bouquets he was an outright failure graciously as he might accept them the holding of them was much as a doughboy might hold his first armful of live grenades the camp's next distinguished visitor was george clemenceau the veteran french statesman who was soon to be premier of france clemenceau saw american troops that day for the second time the first having been when as a young french senator he watched general grant's soldiers march into richmond he recalled to the sons and grandsons of those dusty warriors how inspired a sight it had been and he added that he hoped to see the present generation march into berlin when clemenceau talked to the doughboys however he had more than old memories with which to stir them he has a graceful complete command of the english language in which he made the two or three addresses interspersed in the full program of his stay in one speech m clemenceau said i feel highly honored at the privilege of addressing you i know america well having lived in your country which i have always admired and i am deeply impressed by the presence of an american army on french soil in defense of liberty right and civilization against the barbarians my mind compares this event to the pilgrim fathers who landed on plymouth rock seeking liberty and finding it now their children's children are returning to fight for the liberty of france and the world you men have come to france with disinterested motives you came not because you were compelled to come 
but because you wished to come your country always had love and friendship for france now you are at home here and every french house is open to you you are not like the people of other nations because your motives are devoid of personal interest and because you are filled with ideals you have heard of the hardships before you but the record of your countrymen proves that you will acquit yourselves nobly earning the gratitude of france and the world at the end of this speech general siebert said to the men who had heard it you will henceforth be known as the clemenceau battalion that was the first unit of the american army to have any designation other than its number another civilian visitor was next though he was civilian only in the sense that he had neither task nor uniform of the army he was raymond poincare president of the french republic the leader of the french bitter enders and sometimes called the stoutest hearted soldier france has ever had president poincare made a thorough inspection he too began with the billets but he was not content to see them from the outside in fact the first that one new major general saw of him was the half from the waist down the other half being obscured by the floor of the barn attic he was peering into president poincare made cheering speeches to the men for the force of which they were obliged to rely upon his gestures and intonations since he spoke no english but his sense was not wholly lost to the doughboys at the peak of one of the president's most soaring flights those who understood french interrupted to applaud him what did he say asked the doughboy he said to give em hell said another fourth and last of the great frenchmen and greatest from the soldier point of view was marshal joffre marne hero who came and spent a night and a day at camp it was mid-october when he came and weeks of driving rain had preceded him in spite of their gloom over the weather the doughboys were eagerly anticipating the visit of joffre and they were wondering if the man of many battles would think them worth standing in the rain to watch a detachment of french buglers buglers whom the americans could never sufficiently admire or imitate because they could twirl the bugles between beats and take their blasts with neither pitch nor time lost waited outside the quarters where the marshal was to spend the night half an hour before his motor came up the sun broke through the drizzle he brings it with him said a doughboy marshal joffrey was accompanied by general pershing the pershing personal staff and joffrey's aide lieutenant colonel jean fabry who was with the french mission in america there were ovations in all the french villages through which they passed and there were uproarious cheers when the party reached the american officers who were to be addressed by marshal joffrey in his short speech he said that america had come to help deliver humanity from the yoke of german insolence and added let us be united victory surely will be ours later after picked men had shown joffrey what they could do with grenades and bayonets the marshal made a short speech to them telling them of how his visit to america had cheered and strengthened him and how even greater was the stimulation he had had from seeing the americans train in france in a statement to the associated press he said i have been highly gratified by what i have seen today i am confident that when the time comes for american troops to go into the trenches and meet the enemy they will give the same excellent account of themselves in action as they did today in practice northcliffe came in december with colonel house and members of the house mission he wrote a long impression of his visit for the english at home in which he said that the finest sight he saw was the american rifle practice in which the united states troops did exceptionally well 
then he praised them for their mastery of the british type of trench mortar for their accuracy with grenades and most significant of all for their able handling of themselves after the bombs were thrown so that they should have a maximum of safety in battle the doughboys had finally learned their hardest lesson sir walter roper lawrence who was coming to america on a special war mission went to camp in early december to see how the doughboys fared so that he might report on them at home he had just inquired of general sir julian bing who had accidentally had the assistance of some american engineers at cambrai what they should be valued at and sir julian had answered very earnest very modest and very helpful i must say that is my opinion too said sir walter when he came to camp they are fine fellows to look at as good-looking soldiers as any man might wish to see they have a wonderfully springy step much more springy than one sees in other soldiers they are clean well set up and they are always cheerful they are splendidly fed and well quartered and they are desperately keen to learn and as desperately keen to get into the thick of things if they seem to have any worries it is that they are not getting in as quickly as they would like to the american troops have everywhere made a decidedly favorable impression i am extremely proud of my british citizenship i have been all my life but if i were an american i would be insufferably proud of my citizenship in all history there is nothing that approaches her transporting such an enormous army so great a distance over sea to fight for an ideal after the new year w a appleton secretary of the general federation of trades unions in england made a visit to france and described the american camps for his own public through the federation organ i see everywhere he wrote samples of the american armies that we are expecting will enable the allies to clear france of the germans most of the men are fine specimens of humanity and those with whom i spoke showed no signs of braggadocio too frequently attributed to america they were quiet well-spoken fellows fully alive to the seriousness of the task they had undertaken and they apparently have but one regret that they had not come into the war soon enough it was pleasant to talk to these men and to derive encouragement from their quiet unobtrusive strength these were the things which were playing upon public opinion in france and england reinforcing the good will with which the first american soldiers were welcomed here when united states soldiers paraded again in the streets of london late in the spring of nineteen eighteen and when they marched down the new avenue du president wilson in paris on july fourth nineteen eighteen the greetings to them had lost in hysteria and grown in depth till the magnitude of the demonstrations and the quality of them drew amazement from the oldest of the old stagers End of chapter 11, recording by John Brandon. Chapter 12 of Our Army at the Front. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Our Army at the Front by Haywood Brown chapter twelve the men who did everything if the american expeditionary force had landed in the middle of the sahara desert instead of france it would not have been under greater necessity to do things for itself and immediately for even where the gallant french were entirely willing to pull their belts in one more notch and make provision for the newcomers the moral obligation not to permit their further sacrifice was enormous and although as it happened there were many things at first in which the a e f was obliged to ask french aid 
this number was speedily cut down and finally obliterated the men on whom fell the largest burden of making american troops self-sufficing in the first half year of war were the nine regiments of engineers recruited in nine chief cities of america before general pershing sailed they were officered to a certain extent by regular army engineers but more by railroad officials who were recruited at the same time from all the large railroads of america and they operated what roads they found and built more till finally after a year during which they had assistance from the army engineers and a fair number of labor and special units they had created in france a railroad equal to any one of the middle-sized roads of long standing in this country with roadbeds rolling stock and equipment equal to the best and railroad terminals which in the case of one of their number rivaled the port of hamburg these were the men who were first to arrive in europe after general pershing who beat them over only by a few days they were not fighting units so that they did not dim the glory of the regulars though they had the honor to carry the american army uniform first through the streets of london they were the first of the army in the battle line too though again their civilian pursuit though failing to serve to protect them against german attack deprived them of the flag flying and jubilation that attended the infantrymen and artillerymen in late october but though the public honor was so limited their private honor with the expeditionary force was without stint it was the engineers here and the engineers there till it must have seemed to them that they were carrying the burden of the entire world on may sixth nineteen seventeen the war department issued this statement the war department has sent out orders for the raising as rapidly as possible of nine additional regiments of engineers who are destined to proceed to france at the earliest possible moment for work on the lines of communication all details regarding the force will be given out as fast as compatible with the best public interests the recruiting points were new york chicago st louis boston pittsburgh detroit atlanta san francisco and philadelphia it was the job of each city to provide a regiment and it became the job of the great railway brotherhoods to see that neither the kind nor the number of men accepted would cripple the railways at home the war department asked for twelve thousand men and had offers of about four times that many the result was of course that the nine regiments were men of magnificent physique and sterling equipment one regiment boasted a hundred and twenty-five members who measured more than six feet their first official task was to help to repair and man the french railways leading up to the lines carrying food for men and guns their next was to build and man the railways which were to connect the american seaport with the training camps and last with the fighting line itself the promise of immediate action in france was fulfilled to the letter two months from the day the recruiting began the lucky thirteenth the regiment recruited in chicago landed in a faraway french town whose inhabitants leaned out of their windows in the late still night to throw them roses and whispers of good cheer anything louder than whispers being under a ban because of the nearness to the front and the day following with french crews at their elbows they were running french trains up and down the last line of communications these were the men who had years of railroading behind them many of them were officered by the same men who had been their directors in civil life it was no uncommon thing to hear a private address his captain by his first name one day a private said to his captain bill you got all the wrong dope on this to which the captain replied severely i told you before about this discipline if you want to quarrel with my orders you call me mister but military discipline was never a real love with the engineers what's military discipline to us we got rock island discipline 
said a brawny first lieutenant when because he was a fellow passenger on a train with a correspondent he felt free to speak his mind i won't say it's not all right in its way but it's not a patch on what we have in a big yard a man obeys in his sleep for he knows if he don't somebody's life may have to pay for it not his own either which would make it worse that's rock island but it don't involve any salutin or if you pleasin if my fellow say tom i don't pay any attention unless there's some officer around this attitude toward discipline characterizes all the special units to a certain degree though the engineer somewhat more than the rest for the reason that they had to offer not a mere negation of discipline but a substitute of their own but whatever their sentiments toward their incidental job as soldiers there was no mistaking their zeal for their regular job of railroading they found the railways of france in amazingly fine condition in spite of the fact that they had many of them been built purely for war purposes and under the pressure inevitable in such work those behind the british lines were equally fine as soon as the american engineers appeared in the communication trains their troubles with the germans began on the second run of the lucky thirteenth men a german airplane swept down and flew directly over the engine for twenty minutes taking strict account then they began to bomb the trains and many a time the crews had to get out and sit under the trains till the raid was over the engineers kept their non-combatant character till after the december british thrust at cambrai when half a hundred of them working with their picks and shovels behind the lines suddenly found themselves face to face with german counter-attacking troops and had to fight or run the engineers snatched up rifles and such weapons as they could from fallen soldiers and with these and their shovels helped the british hold their line the incident was one of the most brilliant of the year partly because it was dramatically unexpected partly because it permitted the americans to prove their readiness to fight in whatever circumstances the spectacle of fifty peaceful engineers suddenly turned warriors of pick and shovel was used by the journals of many countries to demonstrate what manner of men the americans were but the work for british and french on their strategic railways was not to continue for long the great american colony was already on blueprint and the dispatches from washington were estimating that many millions would have to be spent for the work the annual report of major general william black chief of engineers which was made public in december stated that almost a billion would be needed for engineering work in france in nineteen nineteen if the work then in progress were to be concluded satisfactorily general black's report showed that equipment for seventy divisions and approximately one million men had been purchased within three hundred fifty hours after congress declared war including nearly nine million articles among them four miles of pontoon bridges every unit sent to france took its full equipment along and the cost of the railroad engineers alone was more than twelve million dollars not long after the men were running the french and british trains they were building their lines in flanders in the interims of building the american lines from sea to camp the building was through and over such mud as passes description the engineers tell a story of having passed a hat on a road and picking it up found that there was a soldier under it they dug him out but i was on horseback the soldier protested the tracks were rather floated than built where the shell fire was heavy the men could only work a few hours each day under barrage of artillery or darkness and they were soon making speed records the fight against the morass is as stern and difficult as the fight against the bosch said an engineer 
speaking of the flanders tracks one party of men in an exposed position laid a hundred and eighty feet of track in a record time and left the other half of the job till the following day when they came back they found that their work had been riddled with shell holes whereat they fell to and finished the other half and repaired the first half in the same time as had starred them on the first day's job it was not long till they had a european reputation the tracks they were to lay for america though they were far enough from the flanders mud had a sort of their own to offer the terminal was built by tremendous preliminaries with the suction dredge the long lines of communication between camp and sea were varyingly difficult some of them offering nothing to speak of some of them abominable the little spur railways leading to the hospitals warehouses and subsidiary training camps which lay afield from the main line were more quickly done in addition to all these things the engineers were the handy men of france they picked up some of the versatility of the regular army engineers whose accomplishments are never numbered and they built hospitals and barracks too in spare time and they laid waterways and helped out in general pershing's scheme to put the inland waterways of france to work the canal system was finally used to carry all sorts of stores into the interior of france and before the engineers were finished the army was getting its goods by rail by motor and by boat though it was not till late in the year that the transportation machinery could avoid great jams at the port the engineers were from first to last the most picturesque americans in france they came from the great yards and terminals of east and west they brought their behavior their peculiar flavor of speech and their efficiency with them and they refused to lose any of them no matter what the outside pressure it's a great life said one of them from the far west and i may say it's a blamed sight harder than shooing hoboes off the cars back home but there's times when i could do with a sight of the missus and the kids and the ford if it takes us long to lick em it won't be my fault end of chapter twelve recording by john brandon chapter thirteen of our army at the front this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by laszlo beauregard our army at the front by haywood brown chapter thirteen behind the lines the difficulty of describing the american organization behind the lines in france lies in the fact that the story is nowhere near finished the end of the first year saw huge things done but huger ones still in the doing and the complete and the incomplete so blended that there was almost no point at which a finger could be laid and one might say they have done this but at the end of the first year all the foundations were down and the cornerstones named and though much necessary secrecy still envelops the actual facts something at least can be told america could no more move direct from home to the line in the matter of her supplies than she could in that of her men and it was at her intermediate stopping point in both cases that her troubles lay it was as belloc put it the problem of the hourglass plenty of room at both ends and plenty of material were invalidated by a little straight between it was not a month from the time of the first landings of the troops in june 1917 before the wharfs of the ports chiefly used by incoming american supplies were stacked high with unmoved cases the transportation men worked with might and main but the shipping board at home under the goad of restless and anxious people was sending and sending the equipment to follow the men and once landed the supplies found neither roof to cover them nor means to carry them on this was the point at which general pershing began to lament to washington over his scarcity of stevedores and labor units 
and soon thereafter was the point at which he got them. On September 14, 1917, W. W. Atterbury, Vice President of the Pennsylvania Railroad, was appointed Director General of Transportation of the United States Expeditionary Force in France, and was given the rank of Brigadier General. General Atterbury was already in France, and had been offering such expert advice and assistance to General Pershing as his civilian capacity would permit. With his appointment came the announcement of others, giving him the assistance of many well-known American railroad men. When the 1st Division reached France, it was discovered that it required four tons of tonnage to provide for each man. That meant 80,000 tons for each division, which, in the figures of the railroad man, meant 80 trains of 1,000 tons capacity for every division. For the first 200,000 men in France, who formed the basis for the first railroad reckoning, 800 trains were necessary. Obviously, these trains could not be taken from the already burdened French. Obviously, they could not tax further the trackage in France, though the trains and engines shipped had essential measurements to conform to the French roadbeds so that interchange was easy. Still more obviously, the trains could not be made in this country and rolled onto the decks of ships for transportation. So that before the first soldier packed his first kit on his way to camp, the AEF required railway tracks, enormous reception wharfs, assembling plants and factories, and arsenals and warehouses beyond number. The only things which America could buy in France were those which could be grown there by women and old men and children, and those which were already made. The only continuing surplus product of France was big guns, which resulted from their terrific specialization in munition plants during the war's first three years. To find out what could legitimately be bought in France, and to buy it, paying no more for it than could be avoided by Weiss purchasing, General Pershing created a General Purchasing Board in Paris late in August. This board had a General Purchasing Agent at its head, who was the representative of the Commander-in-Chief, and he acted in concert with similar boards of the other Allied armies. His further job was to coordinate all the efforts of subordinate purchasing agents throughout the army. The chief of each supply department and of the Red Cross and the YMCA named purchasing agents to act under this board. It was not long till this board was supervising the spending of many millions of dollars a month, which gives a fair estimate of what the total expenditure, both at home and abroad, had to be. As a case in point, a single branch of this board bought in France, the first fortnight of November, 26,000 tons of tools and equipment, 4,000 tons of railway ties, and 160 tons of cars. The cost was something over $3 million. These purchases alone saved the total cargo space of 20 vessels of 1,600 tons each. The General Purchasing Board adopted a price-fixing policy created at Washington in which it was aided by the shrewdest business heads among the British and French authorities. This board also had the power to commandeer ships, when they had to, notably in the case of bringing shipments of coal from England, where it was fairly plentiful, to France, where there was almost none. A second scheme for coordination, put into effect by General Pershing, was a board at which heads of all army departments could meet and act direct, without the necessity of going through the commander-in-chief. When the quartermaster's department made its budgets, the coordination department went over them and revised the estimates downward, or drafted work or supplies from some other department with a surplus, or redistributed within the quartermaster's stores, perhaps even granted the first requests. But there was a vast saving throughout the Army zone. The problem of America's behind the lines, including as it did the creating of every phase of transportation, from trackage to terminals, and then providing the things to transport, not only for an army growing into the millions, but for much of civilian France, was one which, all wise observers said, was the greatest of the war. Just how staggering were these difficulties must not be told till later, but surmises are free. And the praise for overcoming them, which poured from British and French onlookers, had the value and authority of coming from men who had themselves been through like crises, and who knew every obstacle in the way of the Americans. But if the preparatory stages must be abridged in the telling, there's no ban on a little expansiveness as to what was finally done. 
Within a year, American engineers and laborers and civilians working behind the lines had made of the wastelands around an old French port a line of modern docks where 16 heavy cargo vessels could rest at the same time, being unloaded from both sides at once at high speed by the help of lighters. These docks were made by a big American pile driver, which in less than a year had driven 30,000 piles into the marshy ooze and made a foundation for the enormous docks. Just behind the docks is a plexus of railway lines which, with what incoming and outgoing tracks and switches and sidelines, contains 200 miles of trackage in the terminal alone. It is, for the present, no German's business how many hundred miles of double and triple track lead back to the fighting line, and it is the censor's rule that one must tell nothing a German should know. But there is plenty of track, figures or no figures. Equal preparation has been made for such supplies as must remain temporarily at the docks. There are 150 warehouses, most of them completed, each 400 by 50 feet, and each with steel walls and top and concrete floors. When the warehouses are finished, they'll be able to hold supplies for an army of a million men for 30 days. They are supplemented by a giant refrigerating plant with an enormous capacity, which is served by an ice-making factory with an output of 500 tons daily the whole ice department being operated by a special ice unit of the Army, officially called Ice Plant Company 301. The ice department also has its own refrigerator cars for delivering its wares frozen to any part of France. To provide for gun appetites as abundantly as for human, an arsenal was begun at the same point, which, when completed, will have cost a hundred million dollars. This arsenal and ordnance depot is being built by an American firm, at the request of the French mission in America, who vetoed the American project to give work to French contractors because of the man shortage in France. It has been built under the direct supervision of the War Department, and was specifically planned so that it might in time, or case of need, become one of the main munition distribution centers for all the Allies. Small arms and ammunition are stored and dispensed here, while big guns go direct from the French factories. Regiments of mechanical and technical experts were constantly being recruited in America for this work, and they were sent by the thousands every month of the first year. Maintenance of the ordnance base alone requires 450 officers and 16,000 men. Included in the arsenal and ordnance depot are a gun repair shop, equipped to reline more than 800 guns a month, a carriage repair plant of large capacity, a motor vehicle repair shop, able to overhaul more than 1,200 cars a month, a small arms repair shop ready to deal with 58,000 small arms and machine guns a month, a shop for the repair of horse and infantry equipment, and a reloading plant capable of reloading 100,000 artillery cartridges each day. The assembling shops in connection with the railroad were built on a commensurate scale. Even in an incomplete state, one shop was able to turn out 20-odd freight cars a day of three different designs, and at a neighboring point, a plant for assembling the all-steel cars was making one full train a day. The locomotives were assembled in still a third place. This will have turned out 1,100 locomotives built and shipped flat from America at the end of its present contract. Already a third of this work has been done. And there was, of course, the necessary number of roundhouses and the like to complete the organization of the self-sufficient railroad. Not far away was a tremendous assembling and repair plant for airplanes, the operators of which had all been trained in the French factories so that they knew the planes to the last inner bolt head. The last assembly plant was far from the least in picturesqueness. It was for the construction, from the numbered pieces shipped from Switzerland, of 3,500 wooden barracks, each about 100 feet long by 20 wide, and of double thickness for protection against French weather. The most amusing of the incidental depots was called the Reclamation Depot, at which the numerous articles collected on the battlefield by special salvage units were overhauled and refurbished or altered for other uses. Nothing was too trifling to be accepted. The old clow man of no man's land was responsible for an amazing amount of good material made at the Reclamation Department from old belts, coat sleeves, and the like. Many a good German helmet went back to the square heads as American bullets. In the same American district, there was a great artillery camp with remount stables containing thousands of horses and mules. 
Under French tutelage, the American veterinarians had learned to extract the bray from the army mule, reducing his far-carrying silvery cry to a mere wheeze, with which he could do no indiscreet informing of his presence near the battle lines. So the mule hospital was one of the busiest spots in the port. A short distance from the port, the engineers built a 20,000-bed hospital, the largest in existence, comprising hundreds of little one-story structures set in squares over huge grounds so that every room faced the out-of-doors. Between the port and the hospital, and beyond the port along the coast, were the rest camps, the receiving camps, and a huge separate camp for the Negro stevedores. Near enough to be convenient, but not for sociability, were the camps for the German prisoners, who put in plenty of hard licks in the great port building. Midway between all this activity at the coast and the training and fighting activity in the fighting line, there was what figured on the army charts as intermediate section, whose commanders were responsible for the daily averaging of supply and demand. In the intermediate section, linked by rail, were the supplementary training camps, schools, base houses, rest areas, engineering and repair shops, tank assembling plants, ordnance dumps and repair shops, the chief storage for spare parts, all machinery used in the Army, cold storage plants, oil and petrol depots, the Army bakeries, the camouflage center, and the forestry departments, busy with fuel for the Army and timber for the engineers. The achievement of the first year was literally worthy of the unstinted praise it received, and perhaps its finest attribute was that most of it was permanent and will remain, while France remains, as America's supreme gift towards her post-war recovery. End of chapter 13. Chapter 14 of Our Army at the Front. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Army at the Front by Haywood Brown. Chapter 14 France and the Medicos. The history of the AEF will be in most respects the history of resources cunningly turned to new ends, of force redirected, with some of its erstwhile uses retained, and of a colossal adventure in making things do. Where the artillery was weak, the AEF eked out with the coast artillery. Where the engineer corps was insufficient, the railroads were called on for special units, frankly unmilitary. A whole citizenry was abruptly turned to infantry. But one branch of the service, though scarcely worthy of much responsibility when the war began, was nevertheless the one most thoroughly prepared. The prize service was the medical corps and it was in this state of astonishing preparedness because immediately before it became the medical corps it had been the red cross and the red cross knows no peacetime the question of what is medical corps and what is red cross has always been a facer for the superficial historian broadly speaking the base hospitals of the army are organizations recruited and equipped in america by the red cross and transported to france where they became units of the army under army discipline and direction and supplied by the medical corps stores except in cases where these are inadvertently lacking or unprovided for by the strictness of military supervision in any case where sufficient supplies are not forthcoming from the medical corps they are given by the red cross this is the red cross on its military side in its civilian work which is extensive and in its recreational work it carries on under its own name and by its own authority where it divides territory with the y m c a the division is that the y m c a takes the well soldier and the red cross the sick one whenever either has time on his hands but the medical corps plus the red cross created between them a branch of the american army in france which from the moment of landing was the boast of the nation for a year before america entered the war 
Colonel Jefferson Keen, Director General of the Military Department of the American Red Cross, had been organizing against the coming of American participation. Within 30 days after America's war declaration, Colonel Keene announced that he had six base hospitals in readiness to go to the front, and within another 30 days, these six units were on their way, equipped and ready to step into the French hospitals, schools, and what not, waiting to receive them and to do business as usual the following morning. The six were organized at leading hospitals and medical schools. The Presbyterian Hospital of New York, with Dr. George E. Brewer in command. The Lakeside Hospital, Cleveland, with Dr. George W. Cryle. The Medical School of Harvard University, with Dr. Harvey Cushing. The Pennsylvania Hospital, Philadelphia, with Dr. Richard Hart. The Medical School of Northwestern University, Evanston, Illinois, with Dr. Frederick Besley, and Washington University Hospital, St. Louis, with Dr. Frederick T. Murphy. A little while later, the postgraduate unit went from New York, the Roosevelt Hospital unit from there, and Johns Hopkins unit from Baltimore. Many others followed in due time. These hospital units, recruited and organized under the Red Cross, took their full complement of surgeons, physicians, and nurses. All these became members of the army as soon as they landed in France, and they were supplemented either there or before they crossed with members of medical corps enlisted just after America entered the war. The military rank of the physicians and surgeons conformed in a general way to the unofficial rank of the same men when they had worked together in the hospitals from which they came. There were, of course, some exceptions to this rule, but not enough to make it no rule at all. It was true of the medicos, as it was of the engineers, that they took military discipline none too seriously, because they brought a discipline of their own. Whenever in civilian pursuits the lives of others hang on prompt obedience, there is a strictness which no military strictness can outdo, and this was true of the personnel of any hospital in America before there was thought of war. It was equally true, of course, after the units were established behind the fighting lines. But there was a certain lack of prompt salute, and a certain freedom with first names, which not the stoutest management from the military arm of the service could obliterate from the base hospitals. The medical corps enlisted men were naturally not sinners in this respect. The routine work of the base hospitals all fell to them. It was usually a sergeant of the army, although he was never a veteran, who attended the reception rooms, kept account of symptoms, clothes, and first and second names, and did the work of orderly in the hospital. It was the privates who kept the mess and washed the dishes and changed the sheets. The nurses went under military discipline and into military segregation, sometimes a little nettlesome, when the hospitals were far from companionship of any outside sort. The sites selected for the hospitals were either French hospitals, which were given over, or schools or big public buildings remade into hospitals by the engineers. Each site was arranged so that it could be enlarged at will and the railways which connected the outlying hospitals with the rest of the american communications were laid so that other hospitals could be easily placed along their line there was a splendid elasticity in the medical corps plan one base hospital was much like another except for size those near the line differed somewhat from those farther back but their scheme was uniform at any rate the history of their doings was similar enough to have one history do for them all. Take, for example, one of the New York units which landed in August and was placed nearer the coast than the fighting. It was put in trim by the engineers, then sanitated by the humbler members of the medical corps. The great wards were laid out, the kitchens were built, windows were pried open, always the first american job in france to the great disgust and alarm of the french and baths were put in the chief surgeon had specialized in noses and throats at home when the hospital was ready 
naturally the soldiers were not in need of it being still in training in the vosges so the services of the hospital were open to the civilian population of france by november there was not an adenoid in all of those parts the death rate almost vanished into this rural france where there had been no hospital and only a nursing home kept open by some sisters of mercy who saw their first surgical operation within the base hospital there came this skilful organization handled by men whose incomes at home had been measured in five figures and all the healing they had was free multiply this by twenty and then by thirty before the pressing need for care for soldiers directed the medical corps back to first channels and there will be some gauge of what this service did for france and the gratitude of france was more than commensurate praise of the american medical service floats unceasingly from officials and civilians statesmen and journalists there were constant demands made upon the french government that it should pattern its own medical forces exactly upon the american making it the branch of the medical specialist and not of the politician or the military man the individual officers of the medical corps had much to learn however from the french and the british though they knew hygiene prophylaxis antisepsis and surgery as few groups of men have ever known it they became scholars of the humblest in the surgery of the battlefield every officer of the medical corps was kept on a round of visits behind french and british fronts during the fairly peaceful interim between their landing and the american occupation of a front-line sector the red cross was the great auxiliary of the medical corps it kept up its recruiting in america both for nurses and physicians and for supplies and in supplies it played its greatest part the red cross maintained enormous warehouses separate entirely from army control which contained provisions to meet every possible shortage it was known by the red cross that never in the history of the world had there been a medical corps of any army that had not finally broken down no matter how painstaking the provision the need was always tragically greater and so surgical dressings sets of surgical instruments medicines antiseptics and anesthetics piled up in the great a r c storehouses then there were the things for which the medical corps frankly made no provision which could have no place in a strictly military program such as food delicacies of great cost special articles of clothing and amusements every hospital convalescent ward had its phonograph its checkerboards its chess sets and its dominoes that was the red cross the red cross had three hospitals of its own in paris the first of these was at newley the hospital which had been the american ambulance hospital from the beginning of the war given over on the third anniversary of its inauguration and here french and american soldiers american civilians who worked with the army and red cross officers and men were cared for the second had been dr blake's hospital and when it became a red cross hospital it was made to include the gigantic laboratory where investigations were made and where the american red cross had the honor to ferret out the cause of trench fever this fever had been one of the baffling tragedies of the war because in the press of caring for their wounded other hospitals had been unable to give it sufficient research the third was the reed hospital equipped and supplied by mrs whitelaw reed in the long period when all this hospital organization was at the command of civilian france inestimably fine work was done it was a sort of poetic tuition fee for the instruction in war surgery which was meanwhile going on from veteran french surgeons to the american newcomers at the end of the first year the medical corps was itself ready for any stress and it had mightily relieved the stress it had already found end of chapter fourteen
chapter fifteen of our army at the front this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b our army at the front by haywood broom chapter fifteen in charge of morale if the army as a whole was a story of old skill in new uses certainly the most extraordinary single upheaval was that of the y m c a though it had grown into many paths of civil life in peace times that could not have been foreshadowed by its founders probably the wildest speculation of its future never included the purveying of vaudeville and cigarettes to soldiers in france yet just that was what the y m c a was doing within less than a year from the american army's arrival in france and its only lamentation was that it had nowhere near enough cigarettes and vaudeville to purvey it accepted the offer of the united states government to watch over the morale of the soldiers abroad partly because it was so excellently organized that it could handle a task of such vast scope and partly because both french and british armies had got such fine results from similar organizations that the american y m c a felt itself to be historically elected the y m c a had cut its wisdom teeth long before it became a part of the army its directors had accepted the fact that a young man is apt to be more interested in his biceps than in his soul and that if he can have athletics aplenty and entertainment that really entertains he'd as lief be out of mischief as in it but even this was not quite broad enough for the needs of the army away from home and one of the first things the y m c a did in france and the stoutest pillar of its great success was to abandon the slightest aversion to bad language or to the irreligion that brims out of a cold wet and tired soldier in defiant spurts and to cultivate in their stead a sympathetic feeling for the want of smokes and a good show the secretary sent abroad to build the first huts and watch over the first soldiers were men selected for their skill in getting results against considerable obstacles those who followed as the organization grew were specialists of every sort there were nationally famous sportsmen to keep the baseball games up to scratch and to see that gymnastics out of doors were helped out by the rules there were men who could handle crowds keep an evening's entertainment going play good ragtime make good coffee and produce cigarettes and matches out of thin air and most important of all they were men who could eradicate the doughboy suspicion that the y m c a was a doleful overly prayerful and effeminate institution the y m c a was dealing with the doughboy when he was on his own time if he didn't want to go to the y hut nobody could make him certain things that were bad for him were barred to him by army regulation but there was a margin left over if the doughboy was doing nothing else he might be sitting alone somewhere feeling of his feelings and finding them very sad the army did not cover this but the y m c a took the ground that being melancholy was about as bad as being drunk but naturally the red triangle man had to use his tact if he didn't have any he was sent home his job was to persuade the doughboy not to instruct him and before long the rule of the y m c a was flatly put never mind your own theories do what the soldiers want that is why the y huts the combination shop theatre chapel and reading room coffee stall and soda fountain baseball locker and cigarette store post office and library which are run by the y m c a from coast to battle line are packed by soldiers every hour of the day and evening the y huts began with the army before the second day of the first division's landing there was a circus banner across the foot of the main street stating this is the way to the y m c a get your money changed and write home by following the pointing red finger painted on the banner one found a wooden shack with a few chairs a lot of writing paper and french money a secretary and a heap of goodwill as the army moved battleward these huts appeared just ahead of the soldiers with increased stores at each new place american cigarettes were on the counters a few books arrived the y m c a proved its persuasiveness by its huts 
a member of the quartermaster's corps said one day in a fit of exasperation over a waiting job how do these why fellows do it i can't turn without falling over a shack built for them by the soldiers in their off time do i get any work out of these soldiers when they're off i do not they're too busy building y huts the first entertainment in the y huts was when the company bands moved into them because the weather was too bad to play out of doors the concerts were a great success by and by men who knew something interesting were asked to make short lectures to the soldiers it was an easy step to asking some clever professional entertainer to come down and give a one-man show then elsie janice who was in europe made a flying tour of the y huts and a little while after e h southern and winthrop ames went over to see how much organized entertainment could be sent from america the result of their visit was the over there theater league to which virtually every actor and actress in america volunteered to belong by the end of the first year about three hundred entertainers were either in france or on their way there or back three months was the average time the performers were asked to give and they circled so steadily that there were always about two hundred of them at work on the y circuit the work of the y m c a did not stop with affording entertainment to the soldiers in the camps they rented a big hotel in paris and another in london and they established many canteens in these two cities so that their patrols secretaries whose job was to rescue stray lonely soldiers in the streets would always have a near and comfortable place to offer to the wanderers then they proceeded the army to aix-les-bains and chambery the two resorts in the savoy alps where american soldiers were sent for their eight-day leaves and arranged for cheap hotel accommodations guides theatres etc and they took over the casino entirely for the soldiers their field canteens were just back of the fighting line and late at night it was the duty of the secretaries to store their pockets with cigarettes and chocolate and with letters from home and shoulder the big tins of hot coffee made in the canteens and go into the front line trenches to serve the men there in fact the y men did everything with the army except go over the top the largest part of work of this type fell to the y m c a because they had the most flexible organization ready at the beginning of american participation but they had substantial help which as time went on grew more and more in volume from several other associations the knights of columbus and the salvation army both did magnificent service in canteens and trenches and of course the red cross took over the sick soldier and entertained and supplied him as a part of their co-army work there was one branch of the red cross which perhaps did more than any other thing to keep up the hearts and spirits of the soldiers it was called the department of home communications and it was directed by henry allen a wichita kansas newspaper man mr allen believed that a soldier's letters did more for him than any other one thing and that failing letters he must at least have reliable news of his home folks from time to time further that every soldier was easier in his mind if he knew that his home folks would have news of him fully and authentically no matter what happened to him so mr allen posted his representatives in every hospital in every trench sector and through them kept track of every soldier if a man was taken prisoner mr allen knew it if he was wounded mr allen knew just where and how the man's family was told of it immediately presently where this was possible mr allen's representative was writing letters from the wounded men to their relatives and was receiving all mr allen's news of these relatives for the men in the hospital in addition to things of this kind done by red triangle men red cross men and the salvation army and the knights of columbus all these organizations worked together to effect distributions of comfort kits and sweaters gift cigarettes and chocolate and all the dozen and one things that made the soldiers find life a little more agreeable there was more than cooperation from the army itself there was the deepest gratitude openly expressed from every member of the army whether general or private because it was a recognized fact that though an army cannot do these things itself it owes them more than it can ever repay End of chapter 15
Chapter Sixteen of Our Army at the Front. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Army at the Front by Hayward Brown. Chapter Sixteen Into the Trenches. After months of training behind the lines, the doughboys began to long for commencement. It came in late October. The point selected for the trench test of the Americans was in a quiet sector. The position lay about twelve miles due east from Nancy and five miles north of Luneville. It extended roughly from Paroy to saint Even after the entry of the Americans, the sector remained under French command. In fact, the four battalions of our troops, which made up the first American contingent on the fighting line, were backed up by French reserves. No better training sector could have been selected, for this was a quiet front. American officers who acted as observers along this line for several days before the doughboys went in found that the shelling was restricted and the raids few. Many villages close behind the lines on either side were respected because of a tacit agreement between the contending armies. The French and Germans sent war-weary troops to the Luneville sector to rest up. It also served to break in new troops without subjecting them to an over-severe ordeal, so that they might learn the tricks of modern warfare gradually. Of course, even quiet sectors may become suddenly active, and care was taken to screen the movements of the soldiers carefully. It proved impossible, however, to keep the move a complete mystery, for when camion after camion of tin-hatted Americans moved away from the training area, the villagers could not fail to suspect that something was about to happen. Perhaps these suspicions grew stronger when each group of fighting men sang loudly and cheerfully that they were going to hang the Kaiser to a sour apple tree. The weather was distinctly favourable for the movement of troops, one of the blackest nights of the month awaited the Americans at the front. Rain fell, but not hard enough to impede transportation. Still, such weather was something of a moral handicap. Many of the newcomers would have been glad to take a little shelling if they could have had a bit of moon or a few stars to light their way to the trenches. Instead, they groped their way along roads which were soft enough to deaden every sound. A wind moaned lightly overhead and the strict command of silence made it impossible to seek the proper antidote of song. One or two men struck up, tramp, 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 the boys are marching, as they headed for the front, but they were quickly silenced. The march began about nine o'clock, after the soldiers had eaten heartily in a little village close to the lines. At the very edge of this village stood a cheerful inn and a moving picture theatre. The doughboys looked a little longingly at both houses of diversion before they swung round the bend and followed the black road which led to the trench line. The people of the village did not seem to be much excited by the fact that history was being made before their eyes. They had seen so many troops go up by that road that they could hardly achieve no more than a friendly interest. They did not crowd close about the marchers as the people had done in Paris. Seemingly, the Germans had not been able to ascertain the time for the coming of the Americans. The roads were not shelled at all. In fact, the German batteries were even more indolent than usual at this point. The relief was effected without incident, although a few stories drifted back about enthusiastic poilus who had greeted their new comrades with kisses. The artillery beat the infantry into action. They had to have a start in order to get their guns in place and some fifteen hours before the doughboys went into the trenches, America had fired the first shot of the war against Germany. Alexander Arch, a sergeant from South Bend, Indiana, was the man who pulled the lanyard. The shot was a shrapnel shell, and was directed at a German working party who were presuming on the immunity offered by a misty dawn. They scattered at the first shot, but it was impossible to tell whether it caused any casualties. When the working party took cover, there were no targets which demanded immediate attention, and the various members of the gun crew were allowed the privilege of firing the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth shots of the war. After that, shooting at the Germans ceased to become a historical occasion. 
but was a mere incident in the routine of duty and was treated as such and the only unusual incident which seriously threatened the peace of mind of the infantrymen in their first night in the trenches was the flash of a green rocket which occurred some fifteen or twenty minutes after they arrived they had been taught that a green rocket would be the alarm for a gas attack but this particular signal came from the german trenches and had no message for the americans the germans may have suspected the presence of new troops for the men were just a bit jumpy as all newcomers to the trenches are and took a few pot shots at objects out in no man's land which proved to be only stakes in the barbed wire or tufts of waving grass although the germans made the first successful raid the americans took the first prisoner he was captured only a few nights after the coming of the doughboys a patrol picked him up close to the american wire he was a mail carrier and in cutting across lots to reach some of his comrades he lost his way and wandered over to the american lines although he was surprised he was not willing to surrender but made an attempt to escape after he had been ordered to halt one of the doughboys fired at him as he ran and he was carried into the american trenches badly wounded he died the next day beginning on the night of november the second and extending over into the early morning of november the third the germans made a successful raid against the american lines immediately after a relief after a severe preliminary bombardment a large party of raiders came across the bombardment had cut the telephone wires of the little group of americans which met the attack and they were completely isolated they fought bravely but greenly three americans were killed five were wounded and twelve were captured the germans retired quickly with their prisoners american morale was not injured by this first jab of the germans on the other hand it made the doughboys mad and better than that made them careful a german attempt to repeat the raid a few nights later was repulsed the three men who were killed in this first clash were very close to the line while minute guns fired shells over the graveyard towards the germans general bordeaux who commanded the french division at this point saluted before each of the three graves and then turned to the officers and men drawn up before him and said in the name of the division in the name of the french army and in the name of france i bid farewell to private enright private gresham and private hay of the american army of their own free will they had left a prosperous and happy country to come over here they knew the war was continuing in europe they knew that the forces of fighting for honour love of justice and civilization were still checked by the long prepared forces serving the powers of brutal domination oppression and barbarity they knew that the efforts were still necessary they wished to give us their generous hearts and they have not forgotten old historical memories while others forget more recent ones they ignored nothing of the circumstances and nothing had been concealed from them neither the length and hardships of war nor the violence of battle nor the dreadfulness of new weapons nor the perfidy of the foe nothing stopped them they accepted the hard and strenuous life they crossed the ocean at great peril they took their places on the front by our side and their fallen facing the foe in a hard and desperate hand-to-hand -hand fight honour to them their families friends and fellow-citizens will be proud when they learn of their death men these graves the first to be dug in our national soil and but a short distance from the enemy are as a mark of the almighty land we and our allies firmly cling to in the common task confirming the will of the people and the army of the united states to fight with us to a finish ready to sacrifice so long as is necessary until victory for the most noble of causes that of the liberty of nations the weak as well as the mighty thus the deaths of these humble soldiers appear to us with extraordinary grandeur we will therefore ask that the mortal remains of these young men be left here be left with us for ever we inscribe on the tombs here lie the first soldiers of the republic of the united states to fall on the soil of france for liberty and justice passer-by will stop and uncover his head travellers and men of heart will go out of their way to come here to pay their respective tribute private enright private gresham private hay in the name of france i thank you god receive your souls farewell 
after the germans had identified americans on the luneville front it was supposed they might maintain an aggressive policy and make the front an active one the germans were too crafty for that they realized that the americans were in the line for training so they gave them few opportunities to learn anything in the school of experience in spite of the lack of cooperation by the germans the doughboys gained valuable knowledge during their stay in the trenches there were several spirited patrol encounters and much sniping american aviators got a taste of warfare by going on some of the bombing expeditions of the french they went as passengers one american at least was able to pay for his passage by crawling out from his seat and releasing a bomb which had become jammed when every battalion had been in the trenches the american division was withdrawn and for a short time in the winter of nineteen seventeen there was no american infantry at the front curiously enough the honour of participation in a major engagement hopped over the infantry and came first to the engineers it came quite by accident the eleventh engineers had been detailed for work behind the british front early on the morning of november the thirtieth four officers and two hundred and eighty men went to Gouzecourt, a village fully three miles back of the line but this was the particular day the germans had chosen for a surprise attack the engineers had hardly begun work before the germans laid a barrage upon the village and almost before the americans realized what was happening the german infantry entered the outskirts of the place while low-flying german planes peppered our men with machine gun fire the engineers were unarmed but they picked up what weapons they could find and used shovels and fists as well as they retired before the german attack according to the stories of the men one soldier knocked down two germans with a pickaxe before they could make a successful bayonet thrust he was eventually wounded but did not fall into the hands of the enemy seventeen of the engineers were captured but the rest managed to fight their way out or take shelter in shell holes where they lay until a slight advance by the british rescued them having had a taste of fighting the engineers were by no means disposed to have done with it the entire regiment including the survivors of Gouzecourt, were ordered first to dig trenches and then to occupy them this time they were armed with rifles as well as entrenching tools they held the line until reinforcements arrived the conduct of the engineers was made the subject of a communication from field marshal haig to general pershing i desire to express to you my thanks and those of the british engaged for the prompt and valuable assistance rendered wrote the british commander and i trust that you will be good enough to convey to these gallant men how much we all appreciate their prompt and soldierly readiness to assist in what was for a time a difficult situation End of chapter sixteen